Hey guys, Chill here. Welcome back to Hardware 3D. This is the final part of the normal mapping mini series, part three. In this video, we're going to learn the deep mysteries of the ultimate normal mapping technique, also known as tangent space normal mapping. And then we're going to write a shader that implements it. There's also going to be a little bit of chili done gone hecked up at the end where we're going to fix an issue with the blue channel to normal vector Z mapping. Let's get started. So those are the major weaknesses of object space normal mapping. Only one-to-one -one skins can be used and no animation. Tangent space, on the other hand, your ve vectors are all pointing in, well, really the positive Z direction. Uh, and then those vectors are mapped onto the surface of the mesh using the surface normal of the mesh. So it's reoriented based on the normal of the mesh. So this positive Z, when mapped to this cube, will point up on this face and left on this face and forward on this face, etc. So instead of your normal vectors being absolutes in the space of the object, rather they are perturbations of the, the mesh's own normal at that point. The mesh normal is the baseline, and then you use the normal map to determine how much to deviate from that baseline and in what direction. All right, now let's see if we can visualize what is meant by tangent space. Uh, I've taken our model boy here, Gobbler, and uh, I've replaced his diffuse texture with a nice little grid here, which is a neat little technique that you can do for visualizing texture type stuff. I've got a plane here. Plane is uh, X, Y plane. Now, we're, we're right now, we're looking in world space. We can visualize what the X, Y plane of tangent space looks like when it is projected into world space. What I'll do is I'll just take this plane here and I will drag it along this uh, model here so that its center point is going to be tangent to the model. And you can see here these these, at for any point, really, on the model, we can get its tangent space, and it's like this. So this is the XY plane of tangent space as viewed in world space for this point on the model. I don't think it's, it shouldn't be too difficult to understand. Yeah, that seems about tangent to the model. Now, one thing that you might note is that there isn't just a single tangent space for any given point on the model, because although we have locked in certain things about uh, this plane here, it's still free to rotate around its you know original Z axis. Set the Blender transform here to local, and uh, you can see there is still one free axis of rotation here, uh, so it's not locked down yet. There are an infinite number of planes that are tangent to this point, and therefore there are an infinite number of tangent spaces. So the final key to the puzzle of the tangent space is aligning it to the texture coordinates used in the mesh. And if we do this, then we can lock it down to a single definite space. And that'll give us a single definite mapping from our normal map tangent space into the object space. We define that mapping with three vectors. The vector going in the X or the U direction is the tangent. The one going in the V direction, the, in the direction of increasing V component along the mesh, that is called the bi-tangent. And then the normal is just the normal at that point, you know, interpolated from the vertex normals. Tangent, bi-tangent, normal. T, B, N, X, Y, Z. The basic idea is these three line up with these three here. This would be, you know, U, V. So you would build a rotation matrix that performs that alignment, and then you would apply that rotation to each one of these vectors that you sample from your normal map. So now we're left with two major problems to overcome. Problem one is how do we get these vectors? Problem two is how do we use them to generate the rotation matrix? Now the getting of the vectors is very tricky. I mean the normal, it's easy. We've already done that. That's just interpolating between the mesh normals. But the, uh, the tangent and the bitangent, they're tricky. You basically have to check the, uh, the direction of greatest change in 
the U and the X across the mesh in order to get that vector in object space. So what that really is, is it's a little bit of calculus, derivative calculus. Now I'm not going to go through the mathematical derivation here because I don't think it is going to be particularly practical, particularly essential in order to achieve these effects. The actual uh, generation of the tangent and the bichangent that is handled by tools such as ASIMP. They can do that for you automatically, so there's no great uh, need for you to master that mathematical derivation. That being said, if you are interested, if you're mathematically inclined and you really want to know, by all means, I'm not saying it's a bad idea. It's always good to know more about the stuff that you're using. Uh, and you can find resources on this not too difficultly on the internet. Here's one that I recommend. I actually got the, uh, the textures for this tutorial here, for what we're using from this site. And uh, it's got a good explanation of normal mapping here. You might want to read it in addition to what I am explaining here. It's, it's using OpenGL, but the concepts are still the same, right? And if you scroll down here, you will find... Yeah, here is the mathematical derivation of actually calculating the tangent and the bitangent. Honestly, it's not the most complicated mathematics in the world. Uh, but at the same time, it will just detract from what I'm trying to do here. I don't want this video to be too long. So here it is for you if you are interested. But like I said, even if you don't go through this stuff, it won't cause any problem for you in the, uh, in the programming or graphics theory side of things. Here's another page for your reference, also an OpenGL tutorial. It has a less uh, rigorous derivation of the math, but has prettier pictures. But at any rate, these vectors will be generated for us automatically by ASIMP. All we gotta do is ask it to generate them for us and it will oblige. Now the second problem is how do we build a rotation matrix which takes vectors from tangent space and brings them into our world space here or our object space. And the answer to that is actually very simple if you use a fundamental concept from linear algebra. And that concept is if you have three orthogonal vectors like this, um, you can actually use them to generate a rotation matrix that takes you from uh, their, the, these vectors' local space into the uh, larger world space that they live in. The vectors have to be orthogonal to each other and they have to all be unit vectors. But if you have that, then all you gotta do is take those vectors and lay them out like this into a matrix. This is your tangent, this is your bitangent, this is your normal, x, y, z. And this is a rotation matrix. In fact, all matrices that are pure rotations are just sets of three vectors like this. Now, if you want a deep discussion and derivation and you want the, uh, the intuition to be able to understand why that is yourself, uh, that's way too big of a topic for the scope of this video, but I recommend this book by uh, Gilbert Strang, Linear Algebra and Its Applications. It's a very good book on linear algebra. If you work through the chapters, you read them, you do the problems, you will be a lot better at all this matrix and vector stuff. You'll have way more understanding uh, than you did before. But again, it's not essential to do this programming stuff and to have a good idea of what's going on, even if you don't have a super intuitive grasp of all the, me of all the uh, mechanics of the mathematics behind it. The end result is you just take those vectors, you slam them together, you slap them together, and you make a matrix out of them, and it just works. This matrix will take points in tangent space and translate them into the object space. And with all that theory under our belt, we're now finally ready to implement tangent space normal mapping. So if we look at the commits here, I revert the test cube, and I also revert that stuff that we did to uh, transform the normals in the object space normal mapping for reasons. Don't worry about it. Um, here is where we actually implement the tangent space normal mapping. Also, for the brick wall, instead of using our test um, test plane, I create an object file for the plane. And the reason for that is because we want to load it with ASIMP so that we can get ASIMP to generate the tangents and the bitangents. Obviously, for a simple plane, it's not that difficult to generate the tangent and the bitangent, but uh, in general, 
you don't want to do it yourself. You want to let a library do it. So we got a lot of meaty changes here. Let's dive in. First off, um, where do we generate the tangent and the bitangent? That's going to be interesting. I believe it is done in mesh.cpp. So here we can see for read file here from asimp, uh, we're generating normals and we're also calculating tangent space. If we scroll down, uh, we can see we've added tangent and bitangent to the vertex layout. I've also added those entries to the different types of um, elements that we can have. So we've added tangent and bitangent in here. And then when we're loading the data for our vertices, we're also going to load float3 for tangent and bitangent. Also, because we're going to be loading the brick wall using our mesh loader, I had to change this, uh, this dirty, dirty path thing in here. It's hard-coded path. Again, we are going to be fixing up the material part of uh, mesh loading at a later date and eliminating this hard-coded path from here. We also have to load the texture for the normal map and the uh, the macro for that is AI texture type normals. One thing you're going to note, uh, a lot of uh, materials, object file materials, stuff like that, they tend to use, uh, let me see if I can find it here, the nano suit because I've edited it. They tend to use map underscore bump as the type of the texture, but really it's not a bump map, it's a normal map. So if you use bump in here, then you've also got to use bump right here. But uh, I prefer to use KN, and then here it can say texture type normals, which is what it actually is. So just a heads up there. And then obviously we're going to change the vertex shader, and we're going to change the pixel shader. If we look at the vertex shader in here, it's taking in the tangent and the bitangent, and it is also bringing those into the view space. So because the tangent and the bitangent are in the view space, when we build our matrix out of the tangent, the bitangent, and the normal, uh, that matrix will bring normals from tangent space into view space, not into model space or world space. Just something to keep in mind. And then for our Fong pixel shader, normal mapped, I mapped the normal to uh, register two because register one might may or may not have a specular map in it. So I say register zero, slot zero is for the diffuse, slot one is for the specular, slot two is for the normal. The shader input now takes the tangent and the bitangent. These guys will be uh, interpolated. Then we build a three by three matrix just like this. We build it out of the tangent, the bitangent, and the normal. We're normalizing them before we build that, and that that's kind of a thing that I'm not going to talk about right now, but that I will talk about later. Normalization of these interpolated parameters is actually an important topic that I have been um, avoiding up until now. But yeah, we build that rotation matrix, then we unpack the normal in tangent space, and then we bring the normal from tangent space into view space. And the rest of this stuff is the same. It's a similar story for uh, normal mapping with specular mapping, only I'm not, I'm not using this one quite yet. We will use it a little bit in the future. But yeah, if you run that, you will see it works. This is the uh, same effect that we were getting before. It works if we change our viewing angle, or if we change the orientation of the model. After that, just a little bit of cleaning up. I finally fixed that problem. Not really problem, but that terrible naming where we were saying things were world position when they were really view position. So I renamed it to view position. Might have also been a good idea to rename this to view normal, but whatever. At least it's not lying, even if it is omitting some information still. So big rename there. And then I just do a little side-by-side -side comparison between object space um, normal mapping and tangent space normal mapping. And although it looks like a lot of files have changed, it's not that big of a deal. Just, you know, some minor changes here, allowing to set the root transform of a model, just for better comparison's sake. Uh, stuff like in camera, what am I doing here? Well, I'm just adjusting the starting position of the camera. Stuff like that. And then because I reverted this, I had to add it back in at this point here. And that's just the, uh, the stuff where we transform, we bring the normals from uh, object space into view space by binding the transform. It's a, it's a double boy situation. Transform C buff double boy. You remember the beginning of this video. 
All right, so the comparison isn't the greatest because I did a little refactoring in, uh, of the Git history, and one of these guys was inadvertently made smaller, but you get the idea. They both look like they're, they're getting about the same effect. Ooh, that's kind of small. Yikes. If you, you feel me? You feel me, guys? Yeah, they're getting the same effect. We can move this brick wall around. It's all looking good. This one, if this one is our reference, then we can see, yeah, it's looking about the same as the other one. Hmm. Center is also a little different. Anyways, we compare them and we note that the results are the same. Of course, now because we have tangent space normal mapping, we would also be able to do some stuff like, for example, map our cube with a single texture and have it work properly for all faces. I'm not going to do that because I'm actually going to apply the normal map to a more interesting model, the model that we've been looking at in Blender up until now, the Goblin Boy. So, uh, but that's going to be the next video. But there's one last thing that I just want to look at here. So, a little bit of Mia Culpa, a little bit of Chili gone done hecked up. Remember when I told you that the normals, uh, the X and the Y components range from negative one to positive one, but Z is generally always positive? Well, that is true. In a tangent space normal map, you're never going to see a negative Z. If you, ha if you do see that, something's gone wrong. But the mapping function doesn't actually change. So you still map them the same as you would for X and Y. For some reason, I got it stuck in my head that, you know, because the uh, they're never using the low part of the range of blue, uh, they just expand the mapping. But that, apparently, I'm, I looked a lot and I can't find an example of where that's done. So I don't know where I got that in my head. But anyways, the proper mapping should be, you know, the same X and Y and Z. You expand the range and then you readjust the uh, the center point. So with the normal map, the pixel shader uh, normal map object, object space one, I just did a little change here with this normal map enabled. So if it's enabled, it does the mapping, or the Z mapping as you've been doing up until now. But if you do normal map not enabled, then it will do the new mapping that I've just described to you, which is the proper mapping. So here it is with the wrong Z mapping that we've been using all along. And now, let me use the new Z mapping. And right away, you can see here, it's, it's not a huge difference, but here's the bad one, here's the good one. You can see that the uh, it's gotten a little uh, darker in the cracks here. It's gotten a little more dynamic. So I think that is just a good proof that uh, Z mapping was bad, and when we fixed it, it looks a little better. And so after that little test, then I just implemented that stuff in all of our uh, all of our shaders there. And that pretty much concludes the normal mapping mini series. In the next video, we're going to put this shader to better use and we're going to render a more interesting model. And that is going to lead us on a little journey of tweaking and twerking stuff to make it look good. Until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more hardware 3D.